like to welcome everybody here this evening on this, the 9th of December at 6 p.m. for our regular meeting of the Board of Trustees for the Blaine County School District. I'd like to call this meeting to order. We do have a quorum present, Trustee Graves, Trustee Baker, and myself, and shortly Trustee Clayton will be joining us up front. But if, and we have our student board representative, Nikki Penrose, as well with us. So at this time, would you please stand and join me in, with the Pledge of Allegiance? The agenda review, Ms. Kaufman, do we have any additions, corrections, or modifications to the current agenda? There is one amendment to the agenda, and it will be an addition to the consent agenda, and I'll just read it as follows. It will be consideration of alternative authorizations for certified staff. The Blaine County School District declares that a need exists in finding qualified candidates for certified full-time professional positions. Therefore, a request is being made to Idaho Department of Education Professional Standard Commission for the following alternative authorizations. And I have four that I can read now or when we get to it in the consent agenda. I think the consent should be fine Okay. if, if it Thank passes. You. Do I hear a motion to accept the addition to the agenda under consent agenda item four? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. It has been added to the agenda. With that, we'll stay with Ms. Kaufman for the oath of office. Okay, Mr. Rob Clayton. Our new almost appointee. <laughs> um, Rob, just repeat after me. I was going to ask you to raise your right hand, but it's your microphone hand. That's all right. <laughs> I do affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. I do affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution and the laws of this, of this state. The Constitution and the laws of this state. And that I will faithfully discharge all the duties of the office of trustee. And that I will faithfully discharge all the duties of the office of trustee. Of Blaine County School District in Blaine County, State of Idaho, according to the best of my ability. Of Blaine County School District number 61 in Blaine County, State of Idaho, according to the best of my ability. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. And the placard will be coming. Welcome officially to the board. Thank you. So, with that, we'll go ahead and move into the accolades and turn the time over to our superintendent, Dr. Holmes. Okay, the first, the first accolade we have tonight is for Kylie Krill. Is she here? There she is. Would you please stand so everybody will know who you are? She is a fifth grade teacher at El Torres. And the accolade says, I want you to close your eyes and imagine the best teacher you ever had growing up. What was it that caused them to have such an impact on your life? For me, it was Mrs. Blackburn, my fourth grade teacher, and Mrs. McMeekin, my A push teacher. We remember these people and hold a special place in our hearts for them because they challenged us, encouraged us, and fought for us. Maybe they provided compassion and understanding and saw us as whole beings with thoughts, feelings, and ideas. Maybe they were so passionate about teaching and learning that their enthusiasm was infectious. Maybe they just seemed to care about us more. These are the hallmark traits of a great teachers. In 20 years, when my daughter looks back on her education, I'm sure she will fondly remember Kylie Krill for these same traits. My daughter will remember the teacher that invited her into the classroom at the open house and asked her to explore and make herself at home in her new learning environment. She will remember the teacher that did not shame her for her 
shame her for her challenges, but instead focused on celebrating her achievements. She will remember the teacher that encouraged brain breaks and 30-second dance parties, a new strategy that I'm going to adopt, <laughs> in class to encourage whole class well-being and balanced fun. And really, who doesn't love the Macarena? As a family, we are, were not entirely sold on the DI program the last couple of years. Kaya, a fifth grader, has attended three different schools in her short educational career and has struggled to find a place in the classroom as she grappled with her own special needs. She was very reluctant to move yet again to the new school, Altura School, but that all changed when she met Miss Krill and visited Altura in the fall. I truly believe the transformation and love of learning that Kaya has this year is directly related to Kylie Krill and her partner Juan Salamanca. He's the Spanish half of the English Spanish instruction. Just He's my better half, actually. <laughs> Does his wife know that? No. Uh, I have watched my daughter become so excited about learning this year that she doesn't even want to miss school for an orthodontist appointment. Ms. Krill has emailed me frequently to communicate about Kaya's special needs, and she has actively engaged Kaya to encourage her to be an advocate for her own learning. Ms. Krill has been open to suggestions about how to best help my daughter and has brainstormed solutions to create the best learning experience possible for Kaya. She is a true professional. Overall, this accolade, while specifically for Ms. Krill, is also for the entire Altura staff. Principal Brad has created a warm and welcoming building. From the art teacher, Joni Cashman, to the PE teacher, Craig Eastop, the staff has made my kids love school. And I am truly a grateful parent for the love and passion that these educators have for my kids. And this was submitted by Marie Wolfram. So, mm -hmm. congratulations. And by the way, this is Kylie's first year with Blaine County Schools. So we snagged a good one. <laughs> All right, the second accolade for this evening goes to the technology savers. Those are, t those, uh, the members of that team are Tim Rocco, Paul Zimmerman, please stand when I call your name, David Guyman, and Jared Ramsey. <laughs> Tim, Jared, Paul, and Dave do an absolutely amazing job. We are so incredibly lucky to have them. Whenever I have an idea with anything in their realm of experience, they always show up quickly and take care of it right away. Tim has a passion for what he does and is always thinking of ways to make things better. Not only does he try to improve things, he often thinks outside the box to come up with new things for our district teachers and students. As for Jared, sometimes it seems he is in my room fixing something before I realize there's a problem. If you email him, he gets back to you right away. If you do a work order, he always comes extremely quickly. I have yet to find a problem that he can't solve. He also comes with a smile. Dave has been a tremendous addition to this team. He's new this year as well. He also is very passionate about his work and is always trying to learn more. When he came to set up a program in my class, there were some problems. Not only did Dave get them fixed, but he taught me how to use everything and is interested in how my students use it. He also comes with a smile and is always willing to help. Finally, Paul, who is always there when you need him. His passion for his work and his energy are very high. Amen. When I was working on getting apps for some iPads, Paul jumped right in to help me and get me going. He also gets back to you right away. All four of these outstanding people are always willing to go the extra mile. They don't hesitate to help in any area, even if it's not directly related to their job description. We are very lucky to have this wonderful team helping us with technology issues. Thank you, Scott Slonam, Hemingway Elementary Engineering Technology Teacher.
Uh, when we were talking about what we were going to present this afternoon or this evening, uh, we looked at what the district has put a lot of effort into lately, and that is with project-based learning. And the PBLs have really taken off in all of our schools. And so uh, when you look at Haley Elementary, my third grade staff has had some tremendous uh, PBLs. I think you remember they were the ones who had the Stay Alive on 75. And in, in that PBL, if you're not familiar with it, was where they, they looked to uh, reduce the accidents with the animals on the highway. And their efforts uh, brought forth high school students and brought forth the community and involved everyone to the point that they actually uh, gave a presentation in front of the county commissioners and started that whole ball rolling where they, there's now a, uh, a county a wide effort to uh, reduce that and, and they took great pride in doing that. Well this year the, the third grade is also taking on a, a PBL that I'd like to share with you tonight. It's called Comets K Club Kids. Uh, the K stands for kilometer because what they're attempting to do is they, they brought forth the idea of how they could do wellness within our community and increase the activity uh, as far as what students could do. And so their, their goal was to design a walking path around Haley Elementary that would be a permanent walking path that the entire community could use. This is my third grade team, uh, Mrs. Shears, uh, Ms. Monk, Ms. Tillmont, and Ms. Baxter. They're an outstanding group of educators with lots of experience in our district, and they work extremely collaboratively in designing these projects. Uh, they, they bring in uh, community members, parents, and then, of course, uh, they, they have a creative way of introducing it to the kids so that the kids really get involved with this and, and take it on as their own projects. And it will expand from there. And I have to uh, tell you that they will be coming in front of you at some point later in the spring with their final draft and probably requesting a few funds from you and, and Howie as to making this a reality because they don't tend to do things in a light way. <laughs> uh, Project-based learning is a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to a complex question, problem, or challenge. It's really a, a focused way for the students to research, but they incorporate, as you can see when we get into this project, they'll incorporate not only language arts, but math and science as well. And then <clears throat> it's really a way to develop those soft skills of collaboration and critical thinking, which are so important today. <clears throat> the essence elements of a PBL include a significant content, 21st century competencies, like we talked about as far as critical thinking and collaboration, an in-depth inquiry. This is not something that would just be take 15 to 20 minutes to research. Uh, a driving question. The need to know, the students have voice and choice in how they present and how they act, and then critique and revision, <coughs> and then a public audience. In other words, they'll present this, and you will be part of that public audience that they'll present to. So it was interesting, all of my, uh, when we got together over the October in-service, all of the grade levels in my school independently chose something about health and wellness as a PBL this year. I think that's because the whole cupcake thing was on their mind at the time, <laughs> but it, uh, it, it's a good way to unite the school. Uh, their look, they were talking about childhood obesity and the epidemic in that, and so the driving question that they came up with was, how could we, as Haley Elementary third graders, design a community walking path to promote health and wellness? That's a big choice. It's a big chunk. They're, they're going to have to take this on to, to do this. Uh, when they start looking at it, they, it expands into what kind of products make up a walking path. They have to map it out. Uh, they actually got an aerial map that you'll see uh, of the entire school so they could lay out a good, you know, what would be the best way to do this and not interfere with all the other uh, things that are happening. Uh, they have to design it. 
and construct the walking path on, on Haley Elementary School grounds. Uh, the audience that they plan to present to would be a board of trustees, the buildings and grounds staff, uh, St. Luke's because they're involved from the uh, wellness point, a landscape architect which they're consulting with as to what type of materials and, and how they should design this. Uh, myself, uh, Patty Olson is the PE teacher, you'll see why she's involved here, and then teachers and families when they do their presentation in front of the school. So this is what they came up with, uh, created during the PBL in service in October 2014. I guess they, they put this in the slides so you would really know they were working on that day. <laughs> and that uh, they actually do get a lot of things done during those in-service days, and they appreciate them greatly. <clears throat> if you click on the link below, you'll get the... Yep, yep. I have to, it will come up. <laughs> Yeah. This is the, what they refer to as the project overview. This is the paperwork that they fill out that, what, that we got from the Buck Institute and it completes the entire, uh, <coughs> makes it a PBL to ensure that they have all the elements of it working together. Um, it's the project overview. So what they did to introduce this, this project to the students was they went to Ms. Olson, who's our PE teacher, and they asked her to play along and come up with the inspiration to, to get the kids thinking about this. And so Ms. Olson presented to each of our third grade classes her concern that students need a way to exercise in addition to the PE class. And one of the things that they came up with was a with the student input was it had to be year-long. In other words, we had to be able to do it all year long. Doesn't cost money or require special equipment. Well, we might fudge on that a little. <laughs> uh, because once their ideas start to expand. And we'd have to be able to do it before, during, and after school hours and that all ages could participate in this. And this really got the students thinking about what they could do. And with a little bit of guided instruction and, and guidance in their questioning, they came up with walking is a great way to reduce obesity. And so all 85 students engaged in a collaborative discussion about how to help solve the problem. There you see the uh, aerial map that they had. And they took on, started taking on how we could uh, design this walking path that could be utilized all the time and not interfere with the ball fields, the, all the activities that we have going on in, in our field. Uh, and also meet the one kilometer uh, distance. <clears throat> they took the aerial view and they started going over all different types of, um, you know, how, how they could connect maybe with the current walkways that we have, how they could stay out of the, uh, the pathways of all the other activities in that. And the students really enjoyed uh, doing this. The, uh, the aerial map was pr provided by an engineer in the valley and they thought that the kids got a big kick out of being able to see and plan and, and then they have to map to scale, uh, use their math ability to map to scale to, to start planning this kilometer uh, journey. In teams, students brainstormed the layup of how they would design a walking path around Haley that would equal the distance of one kilometer. They <coughs> then they started making models of it so that they could again come up with the very best ideas. Uh, and then each one of the different teams presented their concept and they looked at the pros and cons of each one of the team's presentations. Now they want an implementation of their design. If you can read this, it says, uh, please help our PBL come true. So that what they're doing is they will, once the snow melts, they're going to uh, go out with a uh, uh, landscape architecture and they'll blue paint, we'll use blue paint and they'll run a design area and they'll make the path with paint <coughs> on the grass. And then they'll look at, by that time they will have designed all the different kinds of materials that it could be made of, look at the cost value of those materials, look at the labor, et cetera, it would take to do that. 
uh, one of their suggestions that they've come up with is once they have the path painted, see if people really like that. Does it really meet the needs of the people because they'll be able to come out and walk on it and use it. Uh, they're then also connecting it to our current sidewalks because that will take it uh, much larger than one kilometer if they go around our entire facility. So <clears throat> they're also looking at, now they're, they're brainstorming, uh, adding on different points of it so that you have one of those exercises. Then I forget what they're called, but you do exercises at different stops along the way. So they're considering that as well and how much space that would take. So nothing that this uh, students do tends to be just a small project. As they get involved and they start looking at things, it'll get bigger and bigger. But then they hope to come to you in the spring and, and with their final design, with their final cost analysis and material designs, et cetera, and, and then present it to you and see if it might meet something you'd want to entertain in the future and do according to uh, adding on or, or whatever cost that might be. So again, it's a, <clears throat> a way for the students to interact with the community learn and com uh, complete the standards that we have for them in many of the different disciplines, but really become uh, energetic about being a force in the community and taking your <coughs> ideas to fruition. So that's the uh, K Club third grade PBL. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Point. Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Right. It's excellent. Seems Thank neat. You for the presentation and for the excitement that the kids have in, in preparing and helping the community. I told them I'd come first, and then the next one when they come, it's going to be all on them. So. <laughs> Sounds Thank good. You. Look forward to it. Thank you, Tom. Oh, and can I have say one more thing? I'd like to thank Dr. Holmes for coming this afternoon to the county commissioners and speaking on behalf of the social hosting ordinance. Uh, it was very nice of her to be there. Catherine Graves was there as well. There were many people in the audience that was there, and it was a very, very well received uh, uh, by the county commissioners. I think we're going to move forward, but it was very nice to have, as, as a representative of the Drug Coalition, to have Dr. Holmes come and, and speak on our behalf and on behalf of a, a very important issue in the community. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. With that, that's a nice segue to Dr. Holmes and okay. turn the time over to her for the... Um, thank you. And I did speak this afternoon on behalf of the school administration because uh, notice was pretty late. So I think uh, Trustee Graves is going to bring this up later about whether the board wants to also <coughs> get on board and endorse this idea or not. But uh, basically my comments were around um, what the effects of regular alcohol use, and regular alcohol can be just once a week in the studies conducted at many um, medical institutes across this country, what they do to the developing brain. And so um, my concern as an educator is that uh, we try to provide um, all the doorways we can to our kids for a future where they make choices. And so we're pushing them to take advanced opportunity classes. We're pushing them to be all they can be academically but we also want to push them to be all they can be physically and the effects of alcohol on the developing teenage brain can be qu quite uh, significant both in cognitive functioning and in when you just take an MRI of the brain and look at the size of it compared to um, uh, adolescent who does not regularly consume alcohol. So those were kind of the basis of my comments. Uh, so as a community, we want to make sure they have every door open to them including good uh, physical and neurological health um, so tonight, and, oh, I want to also piggyback on the PBL uh, piece and just let you know that all over the district, these kinds of things are happening at the elementary level. It's been uh, some work that's been going on in our elementary schools, even before NYP, kind of um, uh, sporadically. But it's very focused this year, and uh, uh, Ms. Martinez has created a drive on Google where teachers are actually sharing their plans. So if another school wanted to do something very similar, they don't have to completely recreate the wheel. They can go take ideas from the teachers at Haley or vice versa kind of thing. So that is fun to see that file growing. Um, the two things that I wanted to formally report on tonight was first of all the uh, dates and details for the strategic planning since that process has been approved. We've tried to line that out and start reserving the rooms and getting um, 
ream, uh, reams and reams of chart paper and all those kinds of things that we're going to need on board. Um, Thursday morning at our district leadership team meeting, the district leadership team is going to um, go through the first proposed uh, protocol for meeting one and we'll find the bugs and kinks in it hopefully and get it out before it becomes something we're doing in staff meetings all across the district and in community meetings. But this planning, uh, this strategic plan writing process goes from January to June, so it will be the major work that we're doing as a district for the second semester. Um, it will kick off with uh, Daniel Pink on January 15th. If you are a uh, school district employee, this is your week to ask for tickets. They're free, but you do need to ask for tickets so we don't have arm wrestling over seats. Mm -hmm. um, and then starting next Monday, there will be information out there to the public on how they request uh, free tickets as well. Um, so uh, he will be here on the 15th and a lot of what his conversation will help us do is consider future impacts because we're trying to get that crystal ball in front of us. What is the future going to look like for our students in their adult lives and what are the skills and things they will need to know and be able to do and how do we start preparing for that now because a school district is like turning around the Titanic so if we need to be shifting direction a little bit and what it is we're working on, we need to be thinking about that now and coming together as a community around that. Uh, the first two community meetings, I want to strongly encourage the community to participate as much as possible. Board members, staff members, everybody beat the drum because these first two meetings are community brainstorming meetings. And the more ideas we have, the richer our plan will be. Um, and so please come out and brainstorm. It is from these brainstorming sessions that we will then create the community surveys where the community will prioritize uh, what are their top uh, educational beliefs or values, what are their top uh, feelings about the mission of the district, what do they think should be the top goals of the district, those kinds of things. So this is an opportunity for everybody uh, to have voice. Um, we'll be doing the community meetings each time and catch them, Haley and Carrie, and we'll do them uh, at each school, and we'll do a couple with combined depart departments across the district. So there's multiple ways to be able to get to a meeting and be able to be a part of the brainstorming. And then the surveys will go out for anybody in the community to respond to. So please, please help us get that message out that it is very important. You might be getting survey weary, but it's very important to uh, make your voice be heard. Then after we have developed our goals, we will develop uh, subcommittees with experts in whatever the goal areas are to help us develop the action plans. And then the last community meeting, community meeting three, which I believe happens in April or May, somewhere in there, um, will be the community providing the last opportunity for feedback on the draft plan so that the subcommittees can take into consideration the feedback, make revisions, and then send it to the board for approval. So I just want to stress again, it's critical to have all voices. So um, ask your neighbor to attend a community meeting with you <laughs> or something. Get them there. Um, okay, the second thing that I um, have tonight, this is a request of Trustee Baker, I believe at our last meeting, was to have a uh, plan on paper for how we're going to go about the homework uh, review and revision of policy and include our uh, student representatives and also include the policy committee as is the way policy is supposed to be developed for the board. So this is also a document that you can go online and get and we'll try to make it easy for you to find. Uh, the first uh, action steps are the student reps get gathering data from students in middle school and high school about homework, what is helpful homework, what's not helpful homework, what do they think is the right balance, that kind of stuff and then gathering uh, information from teachers, uh, K to 12, on teachers' viewpoints on what is appropriate homework, what is helpful homework, what is not. Then um, these surveys will go out to teachers and students in January. At the end of the month, the student reps will uh, get back together and analyze the data and make recommendations based on the data to the policy committee what they think should be included in a revised homework or policy. Um, and we talked tonight about incorporating multiple viewpoints. That's a uh, uh, critical skill as a board member is to not have just your opinion, but everybody's opinion incorporated. And then the policy committee will take it over 
uh, in March and hold several public hearings. So this will be the time when parents can have an opportunity to speak. The policy committee will also be adding ad hoc members uh, that are deeply passionate and knowledgeable about homework to their committee and then eventually coming to the board with recommendation in late spring. So, any questions? Open that up to the board. I just want to say thank you for a well-developed plan and I appreciate um, the way that it encompasses so many different stakeholders. I should have added that the uh, student reps met tonight. Um, I fed them pizza so that wouldn't feel so much like homework. Uh, but uh, met tonight and developed um, the outlines of the two surveys and we'll be working via Google Docs in the next couple of weeks to refine those surveys so they're ready to go the 1st of January. Excellent. I appreciate the, the student board representative and liaison involvement in that process to help them understand Just how policy changes are made. Um, I, I know uh, Journey, and I, I think I saw him. And, um, Asia was here earlier. Okay. She's gone home to do homework. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and she has quite a drive, so mm -hmm. just wondered if she was in the audience because I've never met her. All right. Appreciate the, the report. And now it's on to the board chair report, and we will go ahead and begin with our student board representative report from Ms. Penrose. All right. Okay. So Wood River High School has an exciting upcoming couple of weeks. Um, our senior project exhibition is on December 17th, and after Christmas break is when we will begin our senior project presentations. And um, this past week, we had sophomores present a project on types of change, and they with their English classes, and they just got to make like they got to make posters or write papers or make music on like types of change from like social change to change in the season, and that was just really cool. And we had the school come and tour all their presentations and vote on which one they liked the best. And we also had the grand opening of our college and career center, which Millie Reedy has done a huge amount of work and started, helped a lot of our seniors out with picking out colleges. And also our winter <laughs> sports have begun, and that is boys and girls basketball and wrestling. And also something that my Spanish class is doing right now is that we're helping out with Stuff the Bus, which is something Kings is putting on, and like um, our whole school might not be doing it, but I know that um, Profe Greenberg has been telling all of us to bring in coats and toys and just anything to stuff the bus and help out families in this valley. Um, Cary High School took third place at state for football. And so congratulations to them. Um, they have an upcoming book fair and just like Wood River, their senior projects are in full swing. And at Silver Creek, they are working on their internship or internship based learning and they have kids that have shadowed realtors worked at the powerhouse and shadowed people that write grants. And all of the senior projects there are done, so lucky them. And they had a school-wide project on epidemic diseases because the Ebola breakout was a big thing and they all got together and worked and researched stuff like that. So that is what's been going on at our high schools. Excellent. Thank Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Thank, Thank you. you very much and look forward to hearing back on the data that you're going to be gathering about homework. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, this past month in November, the day after our last board meeting, um, the board went to Boise for the Idaho State School Boards Association annual conference, and we all woke up early and <coughs> made it there for the session that, <laughs> to start at 9 o'clock on our uh, <coughs> help us complete one of our goals in establishing with our superintendent and uh, a new and improved evaluation tool. Um, we got trained on, on how to use the, the format and the tool that uh, ISBA recommends. Um, and we met last week to kind of finalize that. Yeah, last week to finalize that a little bit more with our superintendent. And we're, we're well on the, that process of fulfilling our, our obligations on both sides with the contract of, of having the mid-year check-in as well. So things are going well. Um, as far as the, the other conf rest of the convention, um, 
there was a variety of work sessions that we were able to attend. Um, Ms. Kaufman and I, um, and Trustee Graves, attended one on more effective meetings, and we learned that we are extremely fortunate to have our board clerk that we have, who <laughs> keeps us well in line. Um, um, we'll be touching a little bit more on it shortly about uh, how important the agenda is to a, to a meeting. Um, I don't know if there's any other board members who'd like to speak out about uh, some of the work sessions that they attended or thoughts that they had off the come of the convention. Well, the other one that I really thought was helpful was the restorative justice, and we're going to be pursuing that, um, hopefully, with, um, I know Catherine has gotten in touch with the judge who gave that, and so um, possibly we'll be hearing more about that. Mm -hmm. That'll be one thing the, the board will be discussing mm -hmm. more than likely. Trustee, I or just want to give the board public kudos for some of the additional work they did while they were in Boise. Is we had a student who was hospitalized at the time in Boise, and they took a visit to that student in the evening with I don't know how much snow on the ground already. Mm -hmm. um, Slick. A lot. I think the student was in shock. <laughs> because of the fact that the board showed up in his hospital room, but <laughs> <laughs> I just want them to, to be recognized for going on above and beyond to let our students know how much we care about them. Thank you. And you too. You were sure. there too. So. I drove. <laughs> <laughs> and that was no easy feat. <laughs> uh, so, all right, Trustee Baker. Um, one of the sessions I attended was with a school resource officer from works with Meridian Schools and Boise Schools, and. It was very enlightening just talking about some of the challenges that our students face that are very different than it even was five years ago with online media and social networking and the challenges they face in navigating that world and um, some of the pitfalls and just his experiences in trying to help districts identify what those issues are to help guide them in making better choices. I appreciate you bringing that up. That's something that we as a board need to be cognizant of. Um, we as parents need to be cognizant, <coughs> cognizant of as, uh, as our youth are, are growing up and then having to adapt into a, a changing world, a world that didn't exist when we were growing up, mm -hmm. getting faced with a lot more challenges um, right at their fingertips. So with that, <coughs> if there's nothing further about ISBA. Um, we'll go ahead and move forward with the item C, the regular meetings agenda review. Um, this past year we have taken and, and tweaked our agenda slightly, um, shifted things around, <coughs> moved public comment back more to the middle of the meeting, um, separated out the information and the decisions and we did that with the purpose of giving the public every opportunity to learn what's in front of us, make a comment before we made a decision as a board so that we could take that public comment into our decision-making process. Um, we've tried to clean it up slightly, and I was going to open it up for, to the board as far as discussion on their thoughts on this new style agenda. Is this something that we would like, that we would like to stick with or revert back to the, the original format? Trustee. Um, I think the new agenda is fine. The only thing that I would like to see is I would like to add an additional public comment in the beginning of the meeting like we had at our on our previous agendas because that would allow someone to come in and make a comment if it was did not have to do with a meeting they just wanted to make a comment they could make the comment and leave and they wouldn't have to wait an hour or an hour and a half I like the second comment being in the middle instead of at the end so I do appreciate that but I would like to add um, a public comment maybe after the accolades I guess before the school report. So that would be my only suggestion. Thoughts from the board? I do recall discussions in the past about the public comment being before the school report and how 
we wanted the school report to be at the beginning to allow the students to leave, especially given the potential topics of that public comment period, to allow those kids to leave, get their stuff done. Um, my only other comment would be um, I do like the public comment period being where it is right before decisions, but after information that's presented. Mm -hmm. And just wondering if it's redundant to have two periods, because if somebody just wants to comment to the board without having to sit through a meeting, they can always email it. I like the, I like the, um, I mean, I, I, I always like more comment um, than less. Um, I really enjoy hearing what people say at different points in the meeting. Um, so I, I like to have it at the beginning because sometimes it kind of sets the tone if something's very important. It helps me understand that right up front. Trustee Gray. And if we, if we were to add another comment, I would not have a problem adding it after the school report because of the reasons you just mentioned. Any thoughts, Dr. Holmes? <laughs> I can't speak for experience in Blaine County because most of the time that I've been here it has been the way it is. We modified it shortly after I came. I do know in other places um, public comment can sometimes, I have seen, I have sat in school board meetings where public comment has drug on for over two hours. Um, so I don't think that's an issue here unless we get a bigger room um, type of thing. But I have also seen public comment set a tone very positively for school board and very negatively for school board. So I think that's one of the considerations uh, that has to be weighed as you decide where to put it. I appreciate that, that uh, insight and comment. Mr. Clayton. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to have an opinion on that one right now. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. So um, with that. How about Nikki? Nikki. I'm with Mr. Clayton. <laughs> 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 Good choice. <laughs> <clears throat> with, with that, as, as I look at it and think about it, um, as a board of trustees, it is our, our duty to do our, our business in the public. That being said, it's not necessarily a, a public meeting. It's a meeting in the public, not a public meeting. Um, that being one of the, the considerations. Any of us can be gotten hold of at any point in time via email for those important things that can't wait. Um, and while I've been on the, the board, I've also seen at times that uh, public comment affect the board meeting as well in a positive or negative aspect. can set the tone. Um, I enjoy seeing our schools, seeing the reports from our schools, and really accentuating the, the work that our, our fabulous staff and, and our students are, are accomplishing. Um, I personally feel that it's, it's adequate to have a public comment section, and I would prefer that that would stay after the um, information, but before any decisions are made. That way, the public can be have a chance to share their side on what's being presented before us. Um, so in, in my view, um, I, I think one is sufficient and I would prefer to see that stay towards the end of the meeting before the decisions are made. Can I make one more? Trustee okay. Schroeder. So um, the, you know, the, the po positive and negative is very subjective. I remember times talking about IB where that was taken very negatively for a while. And so I think that we have to be very careful when we um, label something. To me, it's, uh, you know, I, 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 I want to hear and I, you know, I want to hear all, all ideas. I don't kind of put them into a category, so <coughs> I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I, I personally have never seen a comment um, be anything other than positive because it was a comment coming from the public. So that's just my, I mean, that's just the, my lens. I can appreciate that and, and I can see your, your thinking and theory behind that. 
Trustee Graves, did you? Yeah, uh, I, I would I would agree with Liz. Um, if we decide, I mean, I would still encourage us to add this extra public comment because I don't think it's would add that much time. We, but that's my own personal opinion. But if we decide not to, I think we might want to go back to putting some times on the agendas because if someone doesn't have the time to come sit for, we don't know how long it's going to take to get to public comment, an hour, hour and a half, or two hours, then they can come just for at that, that time. Section. Exactly. So, but I'm still in favor of adding a, 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 having two in one of the beginning. Trustee Baker. I think public comment is a valuable tool and it's something that needs to exist and I think it's extremely important to have. I do like the placement. I would have concern about adding times because estimating that time would be very challenging and if you said it was going to be at 7 o'clock and it sure. ended up at 645 and the person came and missed it, that would be very... Even worse. Even worse because I do want to hear from people if they're... If they're very passionate about what they want to say and I I kind of feel like if they're passionate they would put the time in to come and make that comment at that time at that meeting and if they can't make that time have a delegate or like I said before communicate in a different way okay I, I just want to help clarify that when we're talking about positive and negative tone in a meeting when I'm talking about positive and negative tone from my p previous experience with other boards that I've worked for it sets the tone either positively or negatively, and part of it maybe is just a result of how the chair uses the gavel. Um, but whether it is um, how long it goes on, how long it goes on, um, so that is the board beginning their real meeting two to three hours later. And the other piece is if the uh, public comments are very accusatory or are they a sharing of an opinion. And so whether, and that would be the gavel on whether the chair is ensuring that comments are civil and that everybody is allowed to sh express their opinions freely without any accusations. Can I say just quick? We have been really fortunate in this district by and large. <laughs> in fact, I think we all remember the last person who was gaveled. <laughs> um, uh, but I've heard the story. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but so I, I, I think that, I, you know, and I appreciate because you've come from, from districts that are, you know, tens of thousands of people. So, yeah, I can imagine that that was a real issue. And I, I don't think it's an issue here. If it becomes one, we can <coughs> certainly deal with it. But I, I, I hear where you're coming from. Is there opposition provisionally putting one in after the school report to try for a couple months and then coming back and revisiting? at that point in time. I just appreciate our streamlined agenda. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, not that I, I don't want to take away anybody's opportunity to share, because I do feel it's extremely important. And I was a public commenter myself before I was on the board, so um, I value that. But you know, I'm open. I have, I have a question. Um, has there been a call from the public for additional comment, or is this just, just a suggestion of us as a board? As, as far as I know, it's just a suggestion from the board. There has not been a call from the public to add a, a, an additional public comment period. So it's working for the constituency as it stands right now. Don't fix it. <laughs> Robin, our previous, we have just had this new system with one public comment this for the last agenda? three months. Okay. Four. And so, or four months. Yeah. So all the years before, we had a public comment in the beginning of the meeting. And then, I don't know, a year or two years ago, we added one at the end. So we had one in the beginning and one at the end for the last couple of years. And then we went to one. And there was, a, at our last meeting, we had two public comments that did not have to do with our agenda. And I think it was about two hours okay. into the meeting. And that's what made me want to bring it up again. So I would appreciate having maybe a two or three month trial and then we can revisit it. I don't think it's a 
Yeah. I'm okay either way. Just, so um, the, the, the history there was that there was only one, and it was at a time where it didn't help the discussion. You would have forgotten what the person had said, and then they put one at the end, and it was much more helpful. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's um, other school districts, and I would imagine not the bigger school districts, but ones of, of our size that, are, that have a general <coughs> public comment period either at the beginning or the end, and they allow per subject so if you're dealing with a homework policy, during that portion of the meeting, you can make a comment about homework policy before the board votes on that. And I, you know, so I think that this is, I mean, I, I personally would like to see that um, down the road, but you know, if, if, if this is fine for now, because I think two is better than one, so. Trustee Baker. Just one other question. To clarify our past meetings, haven't we at the end opened it up for anybody who wanted to comment at the end of the meeting? So we really do have two public comment periods right now. He, he, yeah, you, you've said that sometimes. Because we've gotten things in and people co can comment at the end of a meeting. I As a courtesy? Yeah. Yeah, we usually do it during the public comment section. Yeah. As a, if they haven't filled out the... Oh, we just oh, at okay. during the... Yes. Okay, so it wasn't yes. at the end of no. the meeting. It was no. just at <laughs> during the public comment session to yes. add additional people. Okay. Yes. That's what I couldn't remember for yeah. sure because I mean, we haven't been doing it very long. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do I hear consensus one way or the other then? Um, <laughs> Let's try it, it for two it, months. It, try it for two months and then see. Are you... Sure, I mean, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see how, many, how long it is. <laughs> okay. okay. With that, we'll go ahead and move forward with the announcements. And on December 16th, we have a financial committee meeting here at the district office in this room. On January 26th, we have a wellness committee meeting here at the district office. We were not able to find a date that worked in December for the wellness committee with everything going on. So we postpone that till January. Um, remember, December 19th is early out for our students' Christmas uh, winter break, and that will be from December 22nd to January 2nd. And as our superintendent, Dr. Holmes, mentioned, we have Daniel Pink coming on January 15th at 6 o'clock at the community campus. Um, as of this week, it's open to staff for to the free get tickets. to get the free tickets, and then it will it's be Monday. open to all public as of Monday. Mm -hmm. So, and with regards to that, um, we have a steering committee mm -hmm. that uh, we are currently searching for applicants to be on that um, strategic plan steering committee. That application deadline is the fifteenth or sixteenth. Sixteenth of this month. And then we as a board will be appointing those um, applicants after the application deadline. We have a few applications right now, but we're searching for all those people who would, uh, who would like to volunteer their time for the future of our students. Um, it's, a, it's a big undertaking, but it's a, it's a necessary and a great undertaking, great opportunity that we have to impact the lives of our, of our kids. So I would encourage people to take advantage of that opportunity. Trustee Baker. Uh, there's one additional meeting that was not listed, and that's the policy committee meeting that is on December 17th um, here at the district office at 4 o'clock. It's just rescheduled. December 17th. Mm -hmm. And it's when and where? It's here on the f at 4 o'clock. So I wanted to make that announcement that that's occurring. Okay. And then our regular January board meeting because of the winter break is pushed back a week and it will actually be the third Tuesday of January and it will be here on January 20th and we will have already started the strategic plan process with Daniel Pink the week before. So it's an exciting time of year for us. Um, is there any other announcements information that I've over overlooked <coughs> before we move out of the, the board chair report? With that, we'll go ahead and move into the continu continuing business and begin open discussions again on the 2015-16 calendar. And 
<clears throat> Once again, we have a, a memo um, submitted to us from our, our superintendent, um, Dr. Holmes, after she met with the administrative cabinet, the superintendent's cabinet, and their recommendation stays to, instead of um, opening up to a calendar committee, to just roll the dates forward in the, um, one for one, correct, roll the dates forward for one year to maintain the, the, the same calendar that we have, but shift it forward one year in order to put the proper focus on the strategic planning process. And um, I've taken a lot of looking at the policy as it stands um, and the word establish um, and what that really means. And in contemplating that and in contemplating all that we have to do in the next six months as uh, <clears throat> Dr. Holmes presented during her um, superintendent report, between the staff meetings, the community meetings, the surveys, I fear that we're going to be overburdening our public with the opportunity to um, fill the vacancies on the calendar committee. I feel that uh, we really need to put the emphasis on our strategic plan. I know there's a would like to be some things discussed in a calendar committee, and some of those things that I've I've heard mentioned that would like to be brought up are are more things for the negotiation time instead of the calendar committee. Um, we do have issues with our calendar. We do. But I also feel that we need to tackle one thing and do it well rather, rather than divide our focus too many different ways and do things poorly. So for that, I would propose that we stick with our superintendents and our administrative cabinet's decision um, to push the dates for, for the one-year calendar and begin looking at the calendar committee early onset of the next school year so that we can be planning for the 2016-17 school year. I'll open it up to the board for any discussions, comments. Uh, I have, a, a, I guess, a question and a comment. When you refer to things that things would be handled in negotiations, what things are you talking about, I guess, that are more of a negotiation item than a calendar item? The concerns that I've heard are more start time, and that's not really a discussion of the calendar committee. It's more of a discussion with the negotiation master contract with our, with our union, as well as professional development days has been... Um, Professional development days? Yeah. Length of day. Okay. And, the, and those, how those days are in, how many professional development days we're going to have, that would be more of a discussion for negotiations, in my opinion. Okay. Um, I guess for myself, I, I would politely disagree, and I would like to see a, a calendar committee formed um, this year. So. Any further thoughts? Um, I just want to concur with what you described as far as given the significant challenges that exist with our calendar and the amount of work and time that would need to be put into dealing with the varied opinions about when school should start, um, how the break should occur um, with timing of semester versus trimester for middle school, high school versus elementary and what impact that has on students and families. Those are very significant issues that I think need to be addressed, but I also feel that putting those ahead of our strategic plan process, it kind of puts the cart before the horse. And I would, I would recommend that we extend it as it is for one year with the intent of really doing an, a, a comprehensive analysis of 
what the best calendar would be for all of our stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, to get the best learning environment. I appreciate that. Any further comment, Trustee Schwartel? I, I appreciate, you know, uh, Catherine is really good at, at making sure that we're following the process, and I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I think, I personally think that we are following the process, um, and I know that there's a gray area there, so, but I understand why you're saying <coughs> what you do, but I, I concur with Kathy and Sean. Nick, any thoughts? Um, if this is a strategic plan is like what should be focused on, I think that like one more year of the current calendar couldn't hurt. Like. Trustee Clayton? The calendar could actually be part of the strategic process as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could kill two birds with one stone as you go through the strategic process and include some discussion as to calendaring when you're doing that as well because you're going to want to plan that out five years and the calendar really dictates the school, mm -hmm. the, the, the future of the school district. So I think you should probably stay status quo and then include that in the conversation that you have as far as planning. I appreciate the, the discussion and the different points of view. And um, after we have an opportunity to hear from our, our public, we will be having a, a decision on that later on in the agenda as well. So, But with that, that concludes the continuing business. And we have under new business um, an extracurricular <coughs> programming review at Wood River Middle School by Fritz Peters. And this is something we as a board are, are starting. Um, this month, we're going to be looking at, at this. Um, next month, school fees is, is they're going to be having a direct impact with the, with the budget and preparations for our budgeting process that are going to be starting relatively shortly. With that, we'll turn the time over to Principal Peters. Thank you, uh, Chairman Benyon, and welcome to the board, uh, Member Clayton. And Nikki, it's great to see you up here too, and thank you all for having me. Um, basically, we were tasked by the superintendent to look at all of our extracurricular events, um, programming and clubs, and just making sure we had a good picture of everything that we do at the school and everything kids can volunteer to be a part of as well. Um, so this is just a snapshot of the fall. Uh, the fall is obviously a very, very busy season in our school. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just start off with most of the sports there. Um, and there was the question of making sure that we looked at, uh, you know, number of uh, supervisors, coaches, et cetera, that we have, as well as if the sport was cut or no cut, and then any kind of other notes. Um, so boys soccer, first of all, uh, those are only in grades in 7th and 8th. And I want you guys to understand that all of our sports are seven and eight. There are minor exceptions to that, which I will discuss with you quickly. But the reason they're seven and eight is that what, that's what our conference is as well. Okay, so that, that's who we compete against as other seventh and eighth graders across the Magic Valley. Um, boys soccer had 28 participants. Uh, almost an exact equal number was cut. Um, so it was a huge outpouring of kids that were interested in going out for soccer. Um, we do have a head coach and an assistant. Um, and even with the current 28, the coaches wanted to make sure you knew. And being on the sidelines, I also know that playing time is an issue. So with 28 players for a soccer team, just getting the kids to have enough playing time is tough. Um, we had a very, very good boys program this year. They went undefeated. And um, you could hear the, sometimes the comments in the crowd as early as, you know, 2-0, 3-0, you know, why can't George get out there or some other kid? And I made up that name. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so that, that, that's always an issue for coaches is playing time. So um, that's part of the whole reason we have a limited number of students on the team. Um, girls soccer, same exact story. 27 and 27 were cut. Um, really a, a very high level of interest and a very high level of competition in both teams. Um, girls volleyball, uh, 25. That's two teams of approximately 12 and 13, and about 14 were cut. Uh, there are two coaches, one for seventh, one for eighth. Now, the, remember that girls' soccer is seventh and eighth, but there, are, there is a head coach and an assistant for that because there's, there's a large number of kids. Um, football is a no-cut sport. There were about 44 kids. 
Um, we do not let sixth graders participate unless they cannot participate in the Optimist League, which we also assist with. They use our fields. They use some of our gear. Um, we coordinate with all their coaches. They use our facilities. Um, so if a student has a certain weight limit in Optimist, if they are over that, then we allow them to participate in seventh grade football. Um, but, uh, you know, football has four coaches, uh, two for eighth and two for seventh. Um, cross country has really, really grown at the school. There are no cuts in cross country, and we do allow sixth graders to participate um, because that is a conference uh, uh, bylaw that sixth graders can participate. Um, and there's a quite a number of our kids that go up and compete at the high school. So we had a really large number of sixth graders participating this year, which is really nice to see. And there are two coaches. Um, we do not treat it as boys and girls. They do compete that way, but the coaches work with both boys and girls um, in whatever they need. Uh, we also have a cheerleading program. And please, I forgot to say, just stop me and ask a question at any time that you need to. Um, cheerleading, seventh thing. Yes, I have a ahead. question. Um, when the Optimist Football League uses the field, <coughs> are they, is it after school or do they, when do they use the field? Um, they, they wouldn't really have a choice to use the field until after school okay. because right after school we have a huge amount of soccer mm -hmm. kids and a huge amount of football kids. Mm -hmm. So at about 5 to 5.30 okay. when all our sports are over, then another wave of hundreds of children come out okay. and they're participating from the peewee little tiny guys all the way up to the sixth graders. So it's, uh, it's quite a, a show. Now it's really exciting if we have a late football game too and a late soccer game, which will go to 7 o'clock or so, and every square inch of that massive, massive, luxurious field we have is just packed with people. It's, it's a wonderful sight to see. Thank you. Um, cheerleading, we do have cheerleaders as 7th and 8th graders. Uh, there is a very high cut number there. There's 12 participants with one sponsor, and uh, 20 students were cut. Um, after school program, the uh, after school program is not a sport. It is a um, intervention that is classified as an intervention in the milepost program. Um, and this is a, uh, students have to get uh, nominated for this in a sense by a teacher where they really need some support. And my social worker, Todd Gunter, who runs this program, wanted me to let you all know that we have the after school uh, program over at the community campus because they have space there in terms of the kids do participate in athletics there too, but they didn't have room to do it in our own school. So they wanted to m he wanted to make sure I mentioned that because um, every, every part of our facility was being used. Um, then we have the three music programs that go on and we do consider these at some degree an extracurricular. They are during the day, during the class periods, um, but they do have uh, competitions all over the state and they do have concerts like this month they have concerts in the evening so kids do have to participate they also need in a sense a uniform they get either a dress or a suit or um, something like that when they have their concerts and the numbers are amazingly comparable in all three uh, 87 81 and 80 so a huge huge um, portion of our students participate 248 um, overall and they um, this is a requirement that they take an art class. It can be performing arts or it can be visual arts. So performing arts are obviously a big choice of the students. And these are year-long classes. Um, then we have leadership, which is another activity that students participate in that is an in-school activity, but then also requires a lot of out-of-school activities. That's seventh and eighth grade. Um, it's not really a cut thing. It's just simply a class size limit that after a certain point, um, we cut the class at, at approximately uh, 20. Um, so there's about 42 kids in the two classes in the fall. Um, there's a student union, which is brand new. Uh, we had elections uh, on election day, and we have 12 students that are actual officers, um, th uh, four per grade level, and they just made the decision that we, they want new water fountains in the school, so I'm working <laughs> with Mr. Royal to do that. Um, then there's a robotics club. Uh, there's about 22 that are participating. This is a class and a competition. Um, they just found out that there's going to be a big new competition in, um, uh, over in the Boise area that they want to attend and the winners of that group may be able to go to nationals. 
Um, then there's also a brand new group the last two years. This is a, in its second year, and that's the National Junior Honor Society. There are about 50 members in that. There are 7th and 8th graders. They have to spend at least a full year in the school to be um, a possible candidate. Then they have an, a very rigorous application process, and they also have to have uh, GPA standards to be um, chosen. Um, they meet after school, during lunch, and they do some after um, outside of school activities as well. Then there's a number of other clubs and things that we have going on. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is a group that kids meet. It's a real small group of about six. Uh, the Real Fun Fishing Club meets, and there's about nine kids there, and they actually go out and fish on the weekends um, with Miss Clark. And then there's the Click Club. That's a brand new coding club that's just starting up. And they just had their first meeting about a day and a half ago, and they had 11 members show up, and they're recruiting more kids to come out. And we just had our Hour of Code today. So um, we had a number of kids participating in the library and in the computer labs today at lunch and in class, and so maybe that number will grow even more. Idify is another group that is open to 6th through 8th. There's about 80 students participating. Um, that is not a constant number, but it is the, the number that has participated so far this this fall, and that's uh, support through the Community Drug Coalition. And they do a lot of uh, physical activity, um, they do some cross-training, and they also do some IDAFI activities. IDAFI stands for Idaho Drug-Free Youth. Any other questions so far? Yes? Um, you have listed the number of coaches or teachers. Not all of those are actually funded positions, or are they? No, m I would say the majority um, for sports are funded. There are some volunteers even in the sports, though. But things like uh, um, IDAFI and the Real Fun Fishing Clubs, National Junior Honor Society, um, some of those are, are just things that teachers do. Um, other things are where it's just really a part of a class, like for the orchestra music, things like that, or robotics. Those are just things that the teachers take on by teaching those courses. So they do not receive an extra stipend for that, specifically for the middle school. Yes? As far as when it goes with the teams traveling to other schools to play, they have a similar number of teams, a 7th grade team and an 8th grade team in the, in the different sports? Yeah, and um, I'd, I'd say if anything our benches are a little bit heavier, but one thing that's happened in our conference is, is uh, Twin Falls in its two junior highs, O'Leary and Robert Stewart, they have uh, two teams, so they, don't, they have a no-cut policy, and that's something some districts have tried. And what they'll do is they'll have two teams, so they book us um, to play them twice. We actually take on the extra home game so that they have to incur the travel costs. That was one of the agreements. Um, the problem with that is then we incur all the, the costs for officials, which is, can be very excessive, and maybe even the transportation might be cheaper. But um, <laughs> one of the concerns about that is we played a Robert Stewart B team and it's not really A or B, it's just a designation. But we played one of their teams the other night that came up here, and it was our third game that week, and there were seven kids on the whole team. And um, they really weren't even competitive, uh, and, and the, they didn't have enough of a bench. A good basketball team is a minimum of ten, and they only had seven on the second team. So it, it, you know, I think there's a lot of concern in the conference about uh, O'Leary and Robert Stewart having two teams in many <coughs> of their sports, because um, we often in girls basketball alone this whole season have had upwards of three games a week. And so it's like one home game till 8.30, then two travel games till 11 sometimes before they get home. And our conference also has a very late start with five o'clock starts because there's a couple of schools in our conference that, that demand that kids don't miss school. So they leave later. And so not only do we start our games very late, but then so if they travel on the road, they may not be done till almost 8 o'clock. Then they go get something to eat. Then they get home. So some of the parents are concerned with the, the number of games we have per week. And it's been three a week for the girls' basketball team for four straight weeks. So that's a lot of nights. And so that's, that's under review by our conference right now of whether they're going to accept a, a two-team uh, group from, a, from a, a school as we speak. Um, so there's a number of other sports at our school. Um, in the winter, we'll also have uh, wrestling, which just concluded. And that's a small, small group of kids. Our numbers in wrestling are way, way down. 
Um, but hopefully we have some coaches now, and that'll, that'll be coming up. Boys basketball is starting on Monday for tryouts after the girls have their tournament this weekend in basketball. Then the rest of the year we have track uh, for boys and girls, and then baseball and softball, which are the new sports that the, the, the board authorized at school sports just last uh, spring. Um, then we have a ton of community organizations um, with IDAFI as mentioned there. The ski education um, group is huge. We have a, a, a number, huge number of students um, leaving for part or um, either in the morning or the afternoon for part of the day to get up on the mountain and train. Um, we've had a very, very good working relationship with the organization. Um, especially in recent times. Uh, footlight dance, a number of our students participate in. Youth hockey is very big, competitive ice skating, horseback riding, swimming, volleyball. There's just a ton of sports there. I think if you can go down a little bit further, there's a couple things there. Um, we did a survey of sixth graders. Um, we only had 54 responses. We put out multiple um, reminders. But, you know, the biggest thing that came across by far is the sixth graders really want more sports. Um, some of them go to BCRD. There's a BCRD, the Blaine County Rec District, has really increased their sports, and they have uh, sports all the way up to eighth grade. Um, and they're, they're having competitive leagues that play all the way up to eighth grade. Um, so just, just as a summation, some of our concerns, issues, problems, things that are going on, um, oh. and... I'm not really speaking to the target of what this information is for. I'm just providing the information. Um, one of our, our biggest issues is just facilities. Um, our gym is booked basically four nights a week after practice. Our multipurpose room is used for, by the cheerleaders. Um, our gym is used, our cafeteria is used by the wrestlers. Um, and that's what even partly why we moved our after-school program. So the facilities are really, really packed. And then we turn away, I would say, probably seven to eight um, uh, requests um, each season from people that, from groups that want to use the gym facility in the evenings because it's already booked. And, and volleyball is one of our traditional groups that we book it with, the 5B Volleyball Club, which is the Junior Olympic team. Um, and they're little kids all the way up to high school, and they're in our gym from, I'd say, January all the way to May, and that's uh, in and out of when one basketball's not in there. Um, and then our other biggest issue is just personnel. Um, right now, almost 70% of our coaches are not on staff. Um, in most districts, you have about 90% of your coaches to 85% of your coaches as staff members um, our simple issue is very easy to figure out. Staff members are very, you know, paid very well here. And uh, so most, most of the times if we hire a teacher to be a coach, they'll stay for a few years and then leave the coaching, and then we have to farm that out to community members. So just the hiring of coaches is very, very difficult. A lot of times when I hire a teacher, um, they work up at the high school too because that's kind of, you know, if you're a coach and you want to coach, you want to coach varsity, trust me. Um, and um, I coached for years. And so a lot of times when we hire a new teacher, they will provide a spot for the high school to coach up there. Um, I had uh, a few of our, three of our teachers were coaching up there, and two of them are very young teachers that just were hired recently. So personnel um, and space are our two biggest issues in, in, in providing even the activities that we do currently have. Ask a quick question before we leave this slide. I just wanted to know what the question, how the question was asked of the kids in that top part. Was it an either or? Was it a, you know, what would you like to see? Pick all of the above. No, it was just a what activities would you like to participate in, in school that you currently don't have a chance to. Okay, so you so, could yeah. say several things. Yeah. If you yeah, they, they, that, that was just there. So right open ended question. We didn't provide them a checklist or anything. It was just it was you know, what kind of activities question. would you like to do? It was a very open ended question. Okay, gotcha. <clears throat> and I would say the sports show up highly because they're not participating in sports because it's seventh and eighth grade predominantly. So mm -hmm. that would key that number pretty high. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? Um, I just wanted to comment about the participation in our music programs and how wonderful it is that we have that opportunity, especially since that's a feeder program for the high school. And just as a reminder that we were listed as the best community in music education for the second year in a row. And this is fairly prestigious. 
Um, we're the only district in Idaho to get this acc accolade, as well as th 350 other districts in the nation also received it. And there is a video that um, was created to talk about this if you want more information. But and they're showing that video at all of our concerts this, these next three weeks that we've had. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a nice uh, warmer up for the crowd. Yeah. And the crowds have just been practically standing room only the last, uh, the band concert and then last night's choir concert. Is that video on our website? <coughs> just to confirm that. Um, you know, in, I, I know that I was looking at this a few years ago and with you in your office and it, it turned into such a complicated issue because you're talking about different seasons, you're talking about different numbers uh, of times a week, um, you're talking, of, it, there's a, there was a whole bunch of different variables. I would love at some point to see, even though it's tough, it's a tough number to get and it would be time consuming, I would love to see percentage wise gr by grade, in, and, and I'd love to see it also by sex, um, how many kids are, are participating in after school stuff once a week, twice a week, three times, four times, five times. You know, so if it's like, you know, five five percent is w once a week, you know, whatever. It, so that you then you know where what's going on there, and then where where are the gaps? Is there a big gap with girls in sixth grade? Is there, um, you know, just you know that would give a, a really good picture. And I know it would be I know it would be a tough thing to do, but if we're going to hopefully put more emphasis on this, it might be valuable to see where the gaps really are. Any data you guys need, just let me know. Yeah. Um, so thank you for putting this information together and presenting to us because I think I knew that this was happening with the cuts and who was making the team because I was hearing from parents, but I just added up um, how many kids were cut from activities in the fall and it was it was 90 kids between girls and boys soccer and <coughs> volleyball and cheery, mm -hmm. cheerleading so that's 90 kids that wanted to participate in something but but couldn't mm -hmm. so I think that's something that we should you know look into and maybe challenge our, ourselves at you know look outside intramural sports I, I, I hear the, the challenges of creating two teams or there aren't other teams to play that may not, some schools may be cutting some sports so there aren't teams to play. Uh, sixth graders don't have teams to play but you've got 28 boys cut from the soccer team. Maybe there's a, you know, I'm just throwing things out. Uh, you know, they could, intramural games or a, a soccer home team. I, you know, I don't know if that's something that we can out there as a, a, a and I can understand and respect ideas. that yeah but I also look at it too that we have a Blaine County Rec Recreation District for a reason and those provide opportunities for students to play through the eighth grade can I respond to that <laughs> I think I, I, yeah I just I think with the with the Blaine County Rec District which is great but it's having it at the school to walk out the door you know, maybe be next to the, the 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 soccer team playing, and I, it's transportation from kids. You know, they may not take the bus. They may not take that extra step to go do that. It also costs money to sign up. So I would just like to to uh, continue looking at this or have have this looked into, and what some other possible ideas are to get these kids playing some sports because this is what our data shows right here from the sixth graders and from the seventh and eighth graders, bro girls and boys. Just going back to the rec, um, I know they're trying to collaborate to expand their opportunities for kids. Um, for example, they were going to start a basketball program for the cut girls, but the interest wasn't there. And they are planning to do that with the boys for seventh and eighth grade. Um, because there would be only 12 kids accepted on the teams for each 7th and 8th would each have 12. And so I know that they're working hard to establish that to kind of cover some of those gaps. Um, 
and there is busing opportunity because there's a activities bus that leaves the middle school each day that takes kids directly to the community campus after school mm -hmm. um, and also kids that are not able to pay for RAP programs have an opportunity to receive those services without a charge. And I grew up in a slightly larger district. There was 90 kids cut from my freshman basketball team. I happened to be one of those. I chose to participate in another sport wrestling instead. And so I think just because they don't necessarily get to participate in their first choice sport, there's still other opportunities for them. And, and I, with the facilities limitations, I think it would be extremely difficult without the addition of, of more facilities to add more right after school programs at the middle school. Um, Fritz, maybe you can speak to that a little bit more. Well, um, that was a proposal that we talked about last year that was um, pushed into this year, but the idea of expanding our gymnasium for an auxiliary gymnasium I still think would be incredibly beneficial to the school and also expanding the cafeteria. Um, the cafeteria right now is a, an assembly line. It is not an um, ideal um, place to sit and relax and eat. Um, and then the gym uh, in the morning from 8 to 8.25 and during lunch is an absolute madhouse. It is crazy. So after school, it's all booked every day, five days a week. Um, and so to incorporate some type of intramurals, which students are asking for because they want to do something at lunch, um, we would need some other place to have that. And you know, some type of gym that could be set aside for a very good intramural program um, could be something that we would really like to see. I mean, it would really be beneficial to our kids. Um, I just think we've outgrown our current facility in many ways. Our cafeteria was built when, because um, the school, I remember someone talking about how the school was built for over 850 kids. Um, I would have to meet that architect um, <laughs> and talk to him about that, because maybe in fire code you could say that, but I just think in, pu in personal space, Right now, at about 720 kids, um, the hallways are just incredibly tight. They're so narrow. For the design of that building, the hallways are much too narrow. Mm -hmm. The classrooms are fine. They're, they're really actually pretty large and well-developed. The facilities are in great shape, but just the, this, the narrowness of the hallways, the, the amount of gym space we have, the size of the cafeteria. Um, so if that's something that you guys would like to revisit as a board, part of the last strategic plan, um, or the facilities upgrade, you know, that's something we would always really speak highly for and, and advocate for. Um, and then the other issue would just be finding people to do that. I think we would find plenty of people to do that. Right now, being in the gym is just really, you know, I, I'd say we have about two or three kids a week that get hit on the head with a ball <laughs> really hard, and they come in with an ice pack, and they're really hurting, and sometimes they go home because it's just, it's a little bit of a madhouse in there. Okay. Yeah. I don't trust you. Trottle, you had a comment? Thank you, yeah. Um, uh, so I think it's all, you know, it comes down to obviously to, to priorities and to what, what do we mean when we say whole child. Um, I, there was a study that came out that talked about how there's two areas that kids are learning. One is content in life that, that allow kids or allow people to be able to excel, to make more money, to be more successful in all kinds of ways. One is that you have to know the content. The other is you have to have a sense of self-confidence. And sports does that for boys um, tremendously well. And for girls, it does it, but less because less girls take sports. So I think that it's really part of what we're trying to do when we educate a kid for the rest of their lives. It can change lives. And um, it does change lives. <laughs> you know, that's all, it, all the... All the studies show that. So I think that this is, it's really, really important to look at this. The other thing is about the, uh, Blaine County Rec. I think they have some great programs and I appreciate, you know, um, the only problem is that you end up with a two-tier system um, and it's pretty obvious to kids what tier you're on. So maybe there's a way to really truly partner where it doesn't seem so two-tier. I don't know how to Mm -hmm. Put that and oh and I and I also I did want to talk I didn't want did want to ask Nikki because she's 
so recently experienced the after school? But, um, yeah, the middle school, I think a lot of the like people don't want to go over to the rec because you want to be part of the school team and be like, I'm on the Wood River basketball team. Like, I'm so cool. Like, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm on the Blaine County rec team. Like, go whatever their mascot is. <laughs> like, you want to be able to be like, I'm a Wolverine basketball player. Or I'm a Wolverine soccer player. Like, that's a big part, like, of just being in a high school, I think, or a middle school. Like, and when you're cut from a team, you don't get to, like, say that I'm a Wood River Blaine player. Like, confidence. It's, yeah. Appreciate your comments. Trustee Baker. Um, I would just like to concur with what Nikki said and um, Trustee Schwartel in the sense of the importance of the sports program. I think that what the rec district is doing right now is a great gap stop measure, but not a final solution. I didn't add that part when I was speaking about it earlier. And I do feel that revisiting the conversation regarding facilities, it would be essential in order to be able to expand our sports program and would be beneficial for our students. That. I just wanted to reiterate that this, the reason we brought this to you tonight is because we are seeing budget season approach and we're trying to uh, get some sense of the board's will on different things and while adding staff might be hard for Mr. Peters because he's got to go out and recruit them, the impact on the budget is minimal compared to the fact that there are no facilities left for sports in that building. Mm -hmm. So it would mean us bringing you a proposal for also addressing that issue. And so um, as we go into budget season, we want to be bringing you proposals that are things that you're interested in and not mm -hmm. things that we've wasted a lot of staff time on. Just one real quick comparison I did today on trying to think about, oh my gosh, the fact that this building is so full after school and there's not rooms for additional teams, was I just went in and compared um, the enrollment on day four of this year of the middle school compared to the high school, just trying to size up facilities as far as gymnasium spaces and that kind of stuff. And the enrollment of the middle school was 734, which is about, um, um, it was actually 90 students less than the high school. So if you talk about comparable facilities for after school sports, and I don't mean they should be, have the big stadium under the lights and that kind of stuff, but just space for kids to compete in after school sports, that is an issue. So. Anything you could clue us in on, on what your will of the board is on whether we really go whole hog at coming up with numbers on this or not? Trustee Graves. Um, we seem to have sort of focused in on winter sports and sports that maybe need a gymnasium, but it well, seems... These are fall right here. Well, with, okay. With it so, so fall sports. Already. With but it. are there, is there still some field space? I know there isn't a second soccer field, but you've got the one soccer field. Would there be enough space on the field for two teams, <coughs> oops, two teams to be practicing? Um, there possibly could be in the area of um, where the, I don't know if it could be a soccer field though, because where the little um, midget football players practice, it's a very uneven terrain. And I think to actually create a competitive soccer field, you have to have guidelines and um, you know drainage and the prop. So it's not built as a field. There's a whole section that here's uh, Chuck Turner Field or Turner Field, and then there's the soccer field, and then there's the two diamonds where the softball and baseball play. But the the, the lower only unreally used area after school is kind of at an angle, Slope. and it really has a, a deep you know, end to it right near the, the asphalt. Um, so that would be a tough place to actually play a soccer, you know, because the midget field is Could so you short. use it for practice? Um, you could, but you'd want to be real cautious about the certain drills you do because it's just a not, it's not a very good surface. Um, and then there's nothing really on the south end. Um, we could start a tennis team. We have a court, I was thinking so, the same thing. You know, there's the, tennis courts that aren't and, and it's a feeder to a high school program, too. And it's a feeder too, to so. the to the uh, it, and the tennis team could and use the, more people. What about more the kids? Basketball courts that are never used out. The outdoor basketball yeah, the courts. Outdoor basketball the, the big court. caution you have to have in outdoor basketball courts are oh. injuries. Yeah. You know, at lunch, even when our kids go down on that asphalt, yeah. they just come in and they look like a raspberry, yeah. and it's really bad news when they go down. 
I was out there playing with some kids, and I took one down, and he went into the pavement bad, and it's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, like no, I'm fixing just, that or something? like. Well, you, you'd have to resurface yeah. it and make yeah. it a rubberized surface or something, which would be so cost you know, in this environment, it would be very, very difficult. But, like, if you wanted to expand the gymnasium, you could expand it out that way. Because I remember sitting in that gym, like, in assemblies, and you'd be sitting on top of the kid next to you, and, like, there was just no room. Well, the, 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 the plan for expanding the gym and the cafeteria was already drawn up, yeah. and, and people already uh, were prepared to bid on it and everything. So, so the, the space that we were looking at is, is perfect to that north end. It fits perfectly, and then we were going to add kind of a... Uh, a wedge or kind of a triangle to really expand the cafeteria out. But our goal for the cafeteria is if we ever get an expansion is to change the seating. Oh my we gosh. have those long, long industrialized 1940 tables yeah. where kids eat in a row and it's really, you know, not real conducive to, you know, just being relaxed. Like the, the high school the kind high of school. has that environment of round tables and kids can get together and stuff and it's a little more cordial. Yeah. Trustee Baker. Um, I appreciate your comments about the enrollment number differences, being 90 students only, and you look at what the high school has with two gyms, an upper and lower gym, a separate wrestling room for the indoor opportunities, as well as numerous weight fields. Room. Pardon me? Weight room. The weight room as a separate space. Um, and the lack of those spaces equivalent to the number of students at the middle school. And so... Like I kind of stated before, <laughs> tying that facility need in, I would definitely be interested in entertaining um, a discussion on facility space at the middle school. And I do want to concur with uh, um, Trustee Schwartel on the, the ability of kids to feel stronger inside, to have some <clears throat> confidence that 87% of female CEOs in the country played college or high school varsity athletics. So, you know, it, it's a real tie-in to having that will to survive that kind of job. So it is a big thing for kids. Any other questions at all? Or? No, I, I, that's good. And I think we have some, uh, have had some good healthy discussion and, and some direction on facility costs and, and budget implications. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. So. Put it in the hole. Put the knob in the hole. All right. <coughs> At this time, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public comment portion of the meeting. And as of now, no, I have received one um, public comment public request. Meeting. Is that all we've received? <laughs> okay. And Government? Mr. Greg Bloomfield, if you would <laughs> mind coming and speaking at the microphone. Okay. And the kids were sports people. Thank you. Thanks for Good evening, Commissioner. Uh, trustees, commission. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get paid, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> trustees of Lane County School District. My name is Greg Bloomfield. My address is 205 Equus Drive, which is south of Bellevue. Um, and I'm here tonight to talk about um, the fact that this afternoon late, and I'm sorry it was so shortly before this meeting, a letter was uh, emailed to each of the uh, trustees of the Blaine County School District. And I'd like to read this letter into the record um, and uh, hope to open a conversation. Um, this is addressed to the Blaine County School District Board of Trustees. And it says, Dear BCSD Board Chair Benyon, by this letter, the Syringa Mountain School Board requests a meeting to commence a dialogue with the Blaine County School District Board of Trustees in the interest of charting a new course in district charter magnet school relations for our community. The first charter was established in the U.S. in 1992. Idaho charter law was written to give communities the power to create public schools that serve their unique needs. The original intent of Idaho's charter school legislation was to create incubators of education innovation that, if proven successful, could be taken to scale in a district essentially positively affecting all students, not just the charter school students. What our, I, what our Idaho legislators failed to do years ago was ensure equitable funding for these cutting edge education endeavors. With the creation of Idaho's charter school law, our, legis our legislators saw fit to fund charter schools using the same state funding formula and allocations as any established public school and district would receive 
but what they did not allow for was the ability of charter schools to benefit from their local community tax base. That lack of foresight has essentially slowed down and in some cases crippled the ability of charter schools to innovate, thrive, and multiply. What would it take to any initiate an era in Idaho where public school stakeholders in either district schools or charter magnet schools respected and supported one another's commitment to providing a quality, equitable public education to all school children? Might the BCSD Board of Trustees consider a bold venture to create the first hybrid charter magnet district partnership where both parties share equally the commitment to provide all BCSD students and families with quality public schools and broader school choice through a culture of collaboration and a level playing field. Might Syringa Mountain School, the first public Waldorf charter school in Idaho, become one of the unique school choices included in Blaine County School District's K-12 through education portfolio? Syringa Mountain School has generated much success in the short time we have been open. There exists a loud positive buzz about what we have created across the valley. We have proven there is a need want by the families and taxpayers in our community for Waldorf inspired curriculum. Our enrollment is currently in the 135 student area and we see our classrooms filling to capacity as each day passes. Many of you have visited and been able to see how engaged and happy our community is. Parent involvement is a key component at our school. We expect many would be willing to voice their strong support of seeking a relationship between our two organizations. A cutting edge collaboration such as this is uncharted territory for Idaho and the nation. The SMS board believes our combined efforts could create a groundbreaking shift in perspective on how district, charter, magnet relationships are defined locally and nationally. The timing appears to be fortuitous. The BCSD board has recently embarked on the visioning of their strategic plan. The newest BCSD trustee, trustee Rob Clayton, brings a, a novel professional toolkit that includes a successful track record as a charter school creator and administrator. We invite you to join with us in building on the progressive intent that motivated the initial Idaho charter school law by pioneering a new dis district charter magnet school relationship. Respectfully submitted. Greg Bloomfield Chair, Syringa Mountain School Board. Thank you. And thank you all for what you all do. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> thank you for your public comment. Can I have you bet. <clears throat> Out of courtesy, is there anyone else who would like to make a public comment at this time? If you wouldn't mind, please coming to the table and stating your name and address. Barbara Browning, Keelan Meadows, Blaine County. This is a public comment on your public comment discussion. <laughs> um, I am familiar with at least one other uh, governmental agency or entity in the county that does just what Liz suggested. They allow comment on each topic that comes before them. The chair maintains advisory um, capacity. He can use the gavel as needed. They suggest maybe a three or four minute time limit per commenter, but that's not set in steel, stone. Um, but to have public input before a motion and a vote on each topic, it doesn't add time. Most topics there are no comments, but if something's controversial, it really helps. And oftentimes, some commissioners have changed their minds, changed their positions, opened further dialogue and discussions because the public brings up points they hadn't thought of. So I just urge you to think of that as you're experimenting, trying things for a couple of months to see, especially as you're going into all these topics you talked about that are coming up in the next six months that are so important. Maybe give it a try. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? And seeing none, we'll go ahead and move forward with the decision um, <coughs> portion of our meeting. And <coughs> we have the consent agenda under it, and we have the consideration of minutes 
special meetings of the board, December 4th. Excuse me, Chairman Banyan. not completed yet. I put this together and did not delete that. So for consideration for tonight's purposes only, the uh, December 4th, two meetings, one at 5 p.m. and one at 6 p.m. have been approved by the board. And so therefore... Okay. So in the consent we'll agenda... those other two on the next meeting. On, okay. So in the consent agenda, we'll just have the December 4th meetings at 5 and 6, uh, December 4th, 2014. The acceptance of monthly financial report, payment of bills, consideration of personnel exiting and entering, and if you wouldn't mind, Ms. Kaufman, reading those. Sure. Uh, under certified professional staff recommending for hire, we have Dina Bachman, alternate setting <coughs> center teacher at Silver Creek High School and Wood, R Wood River High School. Under classified staff exiting, Martin, Millard, custodian at the community campus, and classified staff recommending for hire, Kylie Anderson, ENL paraprofessional at Alturas Elementary, Christine Kirkland, special <coughs> education paraprofessional at Carey School, Angela Luck, paraprofessional at Haley Elementary, and Crystal McCombs, custodian at the community campus. All right, and then we also have item <coughs> four under the cons consent agenda the consideration of alternative authorizations for certified staff. Blaine County School District declares that a need exists in finding qualified candidates for a certified 1.0 FTE professional positions. Therefore, a request is being made to the Idaho Department of Education Professional Standard Commission for the following alternative authorizations. K5 PE on behalf of Lars Hovey, certified in PE 6 through 12. Ninth grade math on behalf of Andrew Christ, certified in math K-8. 612 health on behalf of Kevin Stilling, certified in PE K-12 and health certified in Illinois. K-12 gifted and talented on behalf of Carla Scanlon, certified in elementary education. Do I hear a motion to accept the consent agenda as read? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I said aye. Motion passes. All right. We have the consideration of Silver Creek High School internship um, credit re request. Is there any discussion before we make a motion? Do I hear a motion to approve the um, the Silver Creek High School internship credit request? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And the 2015-16 calendar. Do I hear a motion to roll forward the existing calendar one year with the similar start dates, stop dates, and makeup of the current calendar? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. We have a four to one motion passes. That brings us to the end of the decisions <coughs> and on to item 12, items the board deems necessary. Oh, I have one. <laughs> I forgot we're here now. Um, as Dr. Holmes, uh, as Dr. Holmes mentioned, um, we both attended a social hosting meeting that was um, put on by the Blaine County Commissioners today. And Gwen Carroll 
uh, supported the social hosting ordinance or what some sort of ordinance they don't have it finalized yet on behalf of the administrators and I would like to ask the board to consider supporting some sort of social ho hosting ordinance as well there's a copy thank you and disregard my notes on the top and the bottom so I would like you all to consider this and then possibly before our next meeting unfortunately our meetings on the 20th and the next public meeting for this ordinance they're going to have a hearing I believe is the 13th of January uh, I believe we will all be getting together for a hearing before that that possibly we could uh, attach this to that agenda to vote on it. What number of the date? I think that was December which? December January. 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 Okay. Well, and also we have to get together as a board prior to the Christmas break, I believe, to set the... That's right. Appoint the... Um, steering committee. Steering, to appoint the steering committee. steering committee. And we might be able to do that at that same meeting, in that public meeting. Yeah, that would be great. Have a discussion on if we want to take a position on this. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what that might be. Okay. I think that's a great idea. Okay. All right. Okay. Lori, will you make note of that and, and help us to remember to get that on the agenda for that? Trustee Baker. Um, just regarding that as an agenda item, um, we might want to consider bringing in somebody to talk with us about this. Maybe Michael David from the Drug Coalition or Mr. Bailey who has been involved or some other designee that could speak to us about um, this ordinance and what they're trying to do. So if we had questions, we would be able to have somebody there to answer them. Sure. I'll look into that. I'm not opposed to that, so. Mm -hmm. All know, right. Um, I just wanted to add, you know, I, 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 from what I've heard, I'm pretty sure I support it, but I actually don't know the other side. I don't know if there is another side in this community. I, you know, if there is, I'd like to hear. <laughs> is there? No. <laughs> so if there's no one else who's, you know, on the other side who ever wants to speak out about that, that's fine, or nobody else who's organized. But I always like to hear if there is, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't want to, I don't want to presuppose that I know everything. <laughs> Tom has a comment right. if you want to ask him. Uh, uh, Mr. Bailey, if you wouldn't mind stepping up to the microphone. Really microphone. <laughs> the only discussion that, that they're having right now is the wording on it, on the uh, proposed ordinance. Uh, you know I wrote an article in the paper. If you look, there was absolutely no comments on that we got absolutely no feedback when we held um, town hall meetings for both uh, we had youth involved in town hall meeting they were extremely positive on the concept when we did an adult uh, town hall meeting we had uh, a panel to discuss the issue it was 100 percent in favor of it uh, it'd be pretty hard for somebody to stand up and say no i want to serve alcohol to kids <laughs> and i want the right to do that uh, However, the wording on that, uh, on the actual ordinance that's in front of you, that's probably the 18th revision of that, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, Catherine can attest, as her husband helped write it. Uh, <laughs> but it's been revised, it's been moved forward. So there, there will be some, uh, the county commissioners are considering, you know, maybe some wording okay. of it. Uh, you will always have people that, especially here in Idaho, that are concerned about are you giving more leeway to the police officers than they should have. Uh, but again, those are taken in the, uh, the wording of, the, of how the ordinance is presented. Mm -hmm. So Tom, since you're here right now, maybe you could just give a couple minute recap of what this says, you know, instead of maybe mm -hmm. inviting someone to the next meeting since mm -hmm. you've sure, I been think involved in this the last mm -hmm. two or three years. I would also like to say that there's, I think, 33 states that have social 
hosting ordinances. This is nothing new. Mm -hmm. And this is just our, I mean, Massachusetts has one. Illinois has one. Meridian Eagle. Mm -hmm. So some of the counties also. But if you could just give a couple minute recap. I think the most important thing that would be informative is not just not the wording necessarily, but the main goal. Yeah. What is the purpose? And what are we hoping to uh, address with this ordinance? Uh, okay. When we looked um, several years ago, when we first looked at the issue of drug and alcohol uh, use in the valley and the skyrocketing um, effects that it has on kids, and we, and, and we know the, that the effects are something. We looked at, in, in the surveys, uh, there was preponderance of evidence that, that it was way out of hand in, in our valley. Um, then we looked at the access. Where, where was the access? Where were the kids getting the alcohol? In that? And there it seemed to be two ways that they were getting it. One was they were buying it, walking into an establishment and purchasing it. And the second one was they were getting it uh, through social hosted parties uh, where pr adults condone letting them drink and, and all the things that take place there. So the first thing we did was we worked with the uh, law enforcement and we worked with establishing compliance checks where they actually send in people to, with fake IDs to, to into all the establishments that sell alcohol. And when we first ran that, it was about 50% failure. Uh, they, were, they were actually, people were able to walk in and buy from about 50% of the people in the valley. Uh, any student could walk in and purchase at that time because uh, they weren't checking IDs or you know, they looked the other way. <clears throat> Since then, uh, once we've started doing the compliance checks, uh, and we run those four times a year in the valley, they're, uh, they're unannounced, uh, and they go in and the, and the businesses have been excellent in working with us. Uh, that's now down to you know, somewhere between 80 and 100 percent. We've had several compliance checks that were 100 percent uh, where they checked all the IDs that were faithful to that. Uh, so we've really felt like we've reduced the opportunity, the access that you can get it by, by, by purchasing it. So now we've turned to uh, what, when we did a survey just last year, at the beginning of this year actually, uh, it was obvious that the students felt it was very easy to obtain alcohol and they get it from parties or they get it from there are certain houses in the valley where it's it's very well known that that the adults in that house condone uh, look at at uh, drinking alcohol and and the parties that they have are uh, a rite of passage it's it's not a big deal and so <coughs> social hosting ordinances have popped up as Catherine and his son, all across the country. Uh, we looked at how effective they were. They're extremely effective. And so we started working with law enforcement, uh, our law lawyers in town, uh, some of the government entities, and we've been working on this to craft one that would be for the starting with the county. And that's the one that's in front of you right now. And basically what it says is if you knowingly allow a party to happen, where kids are uh, indulging in alcohol, um, you could receive a fine. It's the first offense is a fine. It's like a ticket. It's a hundred dollar fine. If you continue to do that on a second offense, uh, it could become a misdemeanor, and it can go anywhere from six months in jail to a thousand dollar fine. Um, because if you're consistently doing this, and we know that. We've already heard that in some cases, in some parties, they're just going to charge people to cover the $100 ticket that they know they're going to get. <laughs> uh, we have um, <coughs> community members that, that you know, they, they kind of think that that's how it is, especially around prom. They, they feel they're going to they're, they're gonna just charge it up. But if you do that on a, you know, consistent basis, we, you're going to be charged with a misdemeanor. And I think the other thing is it becomes a deterrent so that parents can say to their child, you know, I, I'm not going to let any of that happen because I'm not going to get a ticket. I'm not going to, I can't do that. I can't condone that. The big, the big push has been from our parent community to say, what you do with your child is your business, but what you do with my child, 
it's not it's not your business. You, we can't let you do that. You have no right to serve alcohol to my child. You have no right to let my child come into your house and consume alcohol. Uh, and then you build upon all the things that happen in, in those kinds of parties. It's not just the alcohol consumption. It's the other substance abuse. It's the sexual issues that are, have arisen. Uh, it's, it's the fights. It's, it's a lot of things when those parties get out of hand. Uh, people have said, well, I, I take their keys. And so I can have a party and let them serve. I'll let them drink alcohol, but I'll just take their keys. The kids will tell you, I gave them some key that I don't have any idea what it tends to. I've still got my car keys. I can leave out the back door and go whenever I want. Uh, it, it, those type of things just, just don't really work. So it, it's become uh, obvious that the, uh, social, the hosting of these parties and, and that has become uh, a major, major issue in our valley. And so this is our attempt to address it. And we'll start with, if the county commissioners pass it, then we'll move to the cities of Ketchum and Bellevue to uh, accept that ordinance and then uh, move into Haley. And, and we've already had uh, meetings with all of the government entities. So they're very much aware of this. They've already looked at the wording. And, and so it's, we feel we've grown, uh, made great progress with that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very Thank you. much. I appreciate your time. We would appreciate your support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else at the item, items that the board deems necessary at this time? All right. So for the next meeting, um, prior to the next meeting, we will have the board appointments for the steering committee as well as discussion as well as the super correct superintendent's appointments as well as the discussion on the social hosting ordinance, which will be happening before December 19th. We don't have a date yet. And then for our January 20th meeting, we will begin looking into and discussing student fees a little bit as well. And we will have a report from our mm -hmm. staff on, on that. So with that, I appreciate everyone bearing with us and sticking through with us this evening. And do, with, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Meeting adjourned at 8.03.